creating a file that automatically ran during the setup to answer these questions, right, you would be creating a batch file. Okay, so it's creating the batch file. Okay, so all of this is done for you through using Setup Manager, through using the Setup Manager wizard. Okay, you then can use the Setup Manager wizard to create the files, but you can also modify the files yourself. You can take a look at them. We're going to take a quick look at the files. So here's the end result. Let's take a look at unattend.txt first because unattend.txt is the file that's going to be the same. In other words, it's going to have the answers that are going to be the same for all of the installations that I do with this file. So I would use a volume license if I was going to do this because I'm actually going to do multiple installations. That's where the volume license would go. I would put the volume license in. Of course, that's not a real volume license. I just put all ones in there for illustration purposes. You can try it out, but I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> and I also put in my name, right, and then Palestra for the organization name. Notice computer name, it doesn't specify. That's because we're going to specify that later on. We're going to specify more than one computer name. Okay, but we're going to use a 32-bit display, okay, and 1024 by 768 with a refresh rate of 85 hertz. The location, the area code is 205. I just put that in there because I'm from Birmingham, and that Birmingham is 205 area code. Then Setup Manager. It says, well, there's going to be a computer name zero that's going to be Palestra 1, a computer name 1 that's going to be Palestra 2, and a computer name 2 that's going to be Palestra 3. What's going to be different about those computers? Well, that's when we go to the unattend.udb. In the unattend.udb, it says, as far as unique IDs, I've got these three unique IDs. i got Palestra 1, Palestra 2, and Palestra 3. All right, well, what's different about them? Well, what's different about them is going to be in their user data. That's what it's saying. Okay, Palestra 1 is different because of its user data. Palestra 2 is different because of its user data. Palestra 3 is different because of its user data. User data. Well, what's different about the user data? The computer name. What it's going to do is, for running each of these, I'm going to be able to create separate computer names. Okay, creating Palestra 1, Palestra 2, and Palestra 3. Now what happens is when you run the installation, when you use the batch file, the batch file uses both of these, right? It uses the unattend.txt and it uses the unattend.udb so that each time the batch file is run for each of the installations, it can run through and do the installations the way they need to be done. But you don't have to create it all by hand anymore. You can use what Setup Manager. Remember, Setup Manager was the one who created all of this, right? Setup Manager was used to create these. We didn't have to create them by hand. So Setup Manager creates these files, and then we can use these files as part of the installation. And that's another one of the advanced installation topics. Another advanced installation topic that you should be aware of is remote installation services. And the reason I say that you should be aware of it is because you don't have to be an expert at remote installation services. But what you do need to understand is the client side of it. In other words, if you become a network administrator later on, you will be actually setting up remote installation services and you'll need to understand all of the ins and outs of the setup. But as a Microsoft certified desktop support technician, you just need to know what should have happened and how that should have happened, what should have been in place in order for that to happen. Okay, and what should happen is that the administrator or even the user sits down at this brand new PC, right? We've got this brand new hire. They sit down, they've got a cable connected to the PC. They do a startup and they have no operating system in it whatsoever but they press F12 okay when they press F12 it goes out to the remote installation server 
Okay, it finds this remote installation services server. Okay, and it pulls down an image. Okay, as a matter of fact, what it does is it gives the user a menu. And the administrator can set it up to where it's as, as specific as uh, first floor accounting department. Okay, and this image can be just CD based. In other words, it just has the operating system in it. So what the administrator has done is just said, you know, this is the i386 folder. You know, just pull it down that way. So it can be CD based, okay, or it can be target computer based. If it's target computer based, then what the administrator has done is done a little bit more work in regards to this, right? Target computer based means that what they've done is they've actually created a target computer. They have uh, put the operating system in it, applications, they've tested it, and then they run, run a program called RIS Setup. And what RIS Setup did is it created this target computer that now you can go get that information. So it goes out, it gets that information, you choose which one you want, okay, and then that information is installed into the client. In other words, it's built. Okay, now you may ask, well, why don't you just use Ghost or some other kind of imaging, right? Alteris or Ghost or whatever. Well, the problem with those types of images is that you have to have a standardization of your computers. Since no installation is actually taking place, but it's just being imaged, you have to have a standardization. It has to be the same hardware. Otherwise, you'd have problems with drivers. But with this type of installation, since there actually is an installation that's taking place, it allows for us not to have as much standardization. In other words, it allows for us to have different types of computers with different types of, of uh, hardware, different types of video drivers, different types of sound drivers, whatever. Okay, now, what it does, if the administrator has done his job you know, properly, then what will happen is it only pulls down necessary files. Remember we talked about the fact that you had the file copy you know, before? Um, and it pulled, you know, it, it pulled all of those files into a temporary folder, and then once it's pulled into the temporary folder, um, then you choose, and you know, well, especially with a target based, it'd be necessary files only. Okay, so it can be faster that way. Okay, but in order for all this to work, you got to have some things in place. The way I like to remember it, in order to have RIS, okay, RIS requires dad okay so riz requires dad okay and what the heck am i talking about well i'm talking about dns because the first thing it's going to do is going to use dns to find a riz server okay so dns implies ip right ip has to be there's a rudimentary version of ip that's already running even though there's no real IP, right? There's no, there, there was no operating system, right? There was no OS, right, in this client at first, okay? It had no operating system in it whatsoever, okay? No operating system to start. But what it does have, if it's going to work, is it's got either a Pixie compliant preboot execution compliant network interface card. So it's got a Pixie compliant NIC, right? Or it's a net PC, which means it's got a built in compliance. Or it's got a special boot disk, a RIS boot disk, okay, in the drive. It's got a RIS boot disk that the administrator used okay so you should know that one of those two uh, three things has to has to be true okay there's no operating system in it but it's either got to be pixie compliant or net pc or have a riz boot disk in it otherwise it's not going to be able to use dns it's not going to be able to use ip and see the uh you know see the network in addition to that active directory has to be working in the network Okay, why does Active Directory have to be working? Because...